This adult Sunday school class was held on Sunday morning, February 12, 1989, at the Trinity Baptist Church in Montville, New Jersey. As I have written on the board, and you can see today we will be studying the Abrahamic Covenant. As we do study the Abrahamic Covenant this morning, let us pray for the Lord's help and blessing upon our studies. Our Father, as we come into your presence, we give you thanks for the blessedness of which we have sung, the blessedness of peace and joy and rest which comes from trusting in you. We thank you for this, O God, for we know that if we enjoy any of it, it is not because of ourselves, but it is only because of your grace and mercy. And we pray, therefore, Father, that with peace in our hearts we may come to study this morning what you have done for us and what you have promised long ago unto your servant Abraham. We pray that you would give to us light this morning, O God, and keep us from error on the right hand and error on the left hand and enable us to steer a straight course through the word of truth. Give to us the Holy Spirit of illumination, Father. Give us light as we consider the major passages wherein you have revealed these promises you made to Abraham. Give us help that we may understand their significance and give us joy and blessing as we enter into the things promised, as we consider what you have sworn to do for your people. Be pleased, O God, to give us a sense of your greatness and glory and that our hearts would go out in praise and adoration to you. And so be pleased to hear our prayer, to minister to us this morning by your grace, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Now, brethren, I must confess that I greatly wrestled with how we should proceed from here. And I intend to say a few words by way of introduction concerning the structure, hopefully, of the next few studies. I decided as I wrestled with how to approach the remaining two uh, covenants that we set up on the board, the covenant with those who had experienced deliverance from slavery in Egypt and from those who had experienced the accomplishment of redemption from sin through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the old and the new covenants respectively, I determined that what we would do is we would begin with a study of the Abrahamic covenant. And I would not attempt right at the outset simply to assert how all of these things relate together, but hopefully by studying the scriptures together we will be able to see how the complex of covenants and blessings associated with redemption from Egypt and how that complex of blessing and covenant associated with redemption from sin, how they fit together and how both are related organically and bound up with the promises made long ago to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So that's what I hope to do. And to show that there is a unity of the Old and New Testaments. And that fundamental to that unity is God's covenant with Abraham. Now that's what I want to show. And hopefully we'll be able to see that by studying the Abrahamic covenant. And I have allotted, God willing, three weeks for our study of the Abrahamic covenant. And in our study of the Abrahamic Covenant, there are three major points for us to consider. First, I want us to consider the features of the Abrahamic Covenant. Secondly, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic Covenant. 
And thirdly and finally, the role of the Abrahamic covenant in God's great work of salvation from sin. The role of the Abrahamic covenant with respect to the whole future outworking of the history of redemption. Okay, you see that? So the first thing that we would consider, the features of the Abrahamic covenant. Secondly, the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And thirdly, the significance of the Abrahamic covenant. That is, what role does the Abrahamic covenant have in the history of redemption or salvation? Now, this morning, we will begin our study of the features of the Abrahamic covenant. We're going to be attempting to answer, or at least to find the scriptural answer, to the following questions. Was who, with whom was the Abrahamic covenant made? With whom was the Abrahamic covenant made? I cannot find a better word than the word recipient. If a covenant is a sworn promise of blessing to God's righteous servant in this context, if that's what it is, a sworn promise of perpetual favor and blessing to God's righteous servant, to whom was this sworn promise of perpetual blessing and favor made? That's the first question. The second question is what promise was given? What exactly was promised? What is the substance of the Abrahamic covenant? Third, is there any token to the Abrahamic covenant? If so, what is it? And fourthly, by what way, method, means, ceremony, etc., was the Abrahamic covenant ratified or put into force or certified, etc. You see where we want to go with it? Now, it seemed to me that the best way to approach this was for us to study the scriptures together, for us to read the major passages together wherein the Abrahamic covenant is revealed, and then having read those passages together to attempt to find from those texts anything that it says about the recipient, about the substance, about the token, or about the ratification, and just to list it on the board. So that's what I hope to begin this morning, and we'll see how far we go. All right, first of all, first passage, foundational passage, Genesis chapter 15. I know there may be some of you saying, why don't you begin in Genesis chapter 12? Answer. I could begin in Genesis chapter 12, but there is no explicit mention of covenant in Genesis chapter 12. Although I grant to you that promises are made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and we will be looking, God willing, at Genesis chapter 12 when we reflect upon some of these things. But the first mention of covenant to Abraham is in Genesis chapter 15. Therefore, we will study first Genesis chapter 15. And I will read beginning in verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. And Abram said, O Lord Jehovah, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And he that shall be possessor of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, to me you have given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man shall not be your heir, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. 
And he brought him forth abroad and said, Now look toward heaven and number the stars if you be able to number them. And he said, So shall your seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am Jehovah that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, O Lord Jehovah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said to him, Take me a heifer three years old, and a she-goat three years old, and a ram three years old, and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he took him all these and divided them in the midst and laid each half over against the other, but the birds he did not divide. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, know of a surety that your seed shall be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them four hundred years and also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge and afterward they shall come out with great substance but you shall go to your fathers in peace you shall be buried in a good old age and in the fourth generation they shall come to here again for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a flaming torch that passed between these pieces. In that day, Jehovah made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Cadmonite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. Right? Now, here are my questions. Can you tell me from this text anything about the recipient with whom the covenant was made, the substance, the token, or the method by which it was ratified? What can you tell me? Brian? was made with Abraham. Very good. Okay, that's right. Anything else? Yes? It also says Abraham's seed will be the beneficiaries of the covenant. Okay, Abraham's seed. Okay. What do you mean, ben, uh, as you say, Abraham's seed will be the beneficiaries. What do you mean beneficiaries? Uh, they will receive the benefits as they'll inherit the land. Okay. Would you say then that they're recipient, or should I change it and make it beneficiary and recipient? Well, they're recipients. They're recipients. I think so. Abraham's seed. <laughs> <laughs> well... You see, it doesn't explicitly say there that the promise is made to Abraham's seed, though, does it? No. But, but it says that they will receive and inherit what is promised, right? Yeah. So we better put that in parenthesis a minute. Okay. <coughs> That's very good observation. Okay. Any, any other observations about it? About what the substance of it was, for example, or the token of it, or the means by which it was ratified. 
Well, can you tell what the substance of it was from the passage? Maybe I'm asking you too much. What exactly was promised to him? Yes? Amen. Which land? Uh huh. Oh, it doesn't say there, does it? It doesn't name the land. It just says this land. Okay. That land in which he was, this land, would be inherited by his seed. And notice verse 7. It says, I am Jehovah that brought you out of Ere of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And then verse 18 Unto thy seed I have given this land. In that day Jehovah made a covenant saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. So that is the very substance of the sworn promise made to Abraham. It is that Abraham's seed would inherit this land. What land? The land described in the following verses the land in which Abraham was then a sojourner and traveler. Another word for that land is the land of Canaan. You agree that that's the land of Canaan? Okay. Anything about the token in the passage? No? I agree, nothing there. Hey, anything about the ratification in the passage? Oh, you're allowed, aren't you? Could you define token just so we know what we're all looking for? Uh, anything similar to the rainbow where God says, this is the token of the covenant that I have made. <laughs> nothing about that in there, is there? No, you're right. Nothing there. Or is there any ceremony or anything associated with the ratification of that covenant? Bill, in the back. Is the, uh, the smoking furnace in the torch passing yeah, all right. Was well, this uh, verse 17? There's this ratification ceremony of cutting up the animals, and then this smoking, uh, this furnace and this flaming torch that passes between the pieces of the cut up animals. Now, this, granted, is one of the trappings of the initial ratification of the Abrahamic covenant, which is certainly difficult for us to understand. There is, however, a parallel passage in Jeremiah chapter 34, which may help us at least to see the same thing in a different context. Jeremiah 34, 18 and 19. And the commentators... And the theologians are divided as to precisely what was the significance of this ceremony of cutting the animal in pieces and then having the torch pass through the animal. But in some way, that torch was associated with God and God's sworn commitment to be faithful to what he had promised to Abraham. And that's clear from the parallel passage in Jeremiah chapter 34. Verse 18, I will give the men that have transgressed my covenant, that have not performed the words of the covenant which they made before me, when they cut the calf in twain and passed between the parts thereof, the princes of Judah and the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs and the priests and all the people of the land that passed between the parts of the calf. So apparently, when did this happen? When did the princes of Judah, the princes of Israel and Jerusalem and all of the people of the land cut a calf in half and pass between the parts of the calf? Well, it doesn't say but that that was associated with them making a covenant is very clear from the text. 
So in this case, it wasn't Abraham that passed between the parts of the calf as though he were making a covenant and symbolically through this ritual saying, I solemnly swear that I will perform what I am promising. But it was a flaming torch, evidently representing God, passing through the pieces of the calf, symbolically saying, I solemnly swear that I will fulfill the things which I have promised. So it's ratified in terms of and by means of this rather unusual ceremony of passing through the pieces of the calf. And there's something else by which it's ratified, not only the ceremony, but it's also ratified with a word of prophecy. It's also ratified with a word of prophecy. Notice Abraham's concern in verse 8. Abraham's concern in verse 8 is this. And he said, O Lord Jehovah, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And God said, Take a heifer. Whereby shall I know? The whole concern of Abraham is with the certainty of what God had said that he would inherit, namely the land of Canaan. And God says this ceremony is associated with the confirmation of what I have said. And associated with that ceremony comes a word of prophecy. Notice verse 12. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a horror of great darkness. And he said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. Abraham is asking God, How will I know that I will inherit the land of Canaan? And he says, Here's how you'll know. I'm going to give you a prophecy concerning the methodology by which this promise of mine will certainly, absolutely, surely be fulfilled. Your seed... That is, your posterity, your descendants, the ones who will inherit the land, they will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And they will be afflicted 400 years. And afterwards, in the fourth generation, they will come here again. And in this way, you will inherit the land. And then God said to him in that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed I have given this land. So, this covenant with Abraham was not made in eternity. It was not made in the days of Noah. It was made in that day. In that day it was ratified. It was ratified in history. It was ratified by an unusual ceremony. And it was ratified by a word of prophecy. It was ratified in history in that day. It was ratified by a ceremony passing through the pieces of the calf. And it was ratified by prophecy, know of a certainty that your seed will be sojourners in a land not theirs. They'll be afflicted 400 years. And afterward, they will come back here. And it will be in the fourth generation because the iniquity of the Amorite has not yet come to a head. It's not yet full. You see those things? So we have the recipient, Abraham. And in some way, his seed are the beneficiaries because it says his seed will inherit the land. The substance is that his seed will inherit this land of Canaan. And it's ratified in history. It's ratified through prophecy. It's ratified through this rather unusual ceremony of which there's at least one other description of a similar ceremony that took place sometime in later on when the princes and heads of the people of Judah and Jerusalem made a covenant and they passed through the pieces of the calf, just like the flaming torch did. Okay? Uh, any other questions or comments on Genesis 15? Peter? There's also a prophecy concerning Abraham's, uh, the rest of Abraham's life. 
Ah, okay, very good. In the prophecy, it's also mentioned the rest of his life, that he'll die in a good old age and be buried in peace. Okay, very good. Yes, Ron and then John. Uh, in verse 6, about him believing and reckoning the right, that, do you have anything to say about that? Sir? No, I do not. <laughs> Would you would you like me to say something about it? Okay, that's a good question. Is verse six a relevance at this point? I wrestled with that, Ron, and I determined not to say anything about it or to get into it, except to say this, and I hope this doesn't open up Pandora's box, that this was not the moment in Abraham's life when Abraham passed from wrath to grace. According to the book of Hebrews and according to the previous description of Abraham's life in Genesis 12, 13, 14, and even in the first part of Genesis 15, Abraham was already a believing, righteous man who was saved and forgiven from his sins and who was walking by faith because it was by faith that he obeyed God and left Ur of the Chaldees in the first place, according to the writer of Hebrews, not knowing where he went. And the reason that Paul quotes this as the passage which indicates the method of justification by faith is I really think something that it's interesting and it's very important, but it really is uh, something I determined not to try to get into this morning because it's not directly related to the issue at hand, except with regard to this one point. It was not the moment in Abraham's life when he passed from wrath to grace, and the analogy of Scripture makes that abundantly clear. So that this covenant was not made with a wicked man, but it was made with a man who was already righteous, and in who in this very context is declared by God to be righteous. So that's... I, I, in a sense, I'm glad you made me say something about it because I, I probably would have just totally avoided it. Thank you. Yes, John. Where does the prophecy that Abraham's descendant will be from his own bowels, the surety of that, though it hadn't, it hadn't been realized at that point in time, how does that come in to the uh, categories that you have up there? You didn't know that Isaac was, was going to be the question is how does the statement of verse 4 that Abraham's heir should come out of his own bowels fit with the promise of his seed and with the promise of his seed inheriting the land notice verse 4 behold the word of Jehovah came to him saying this man shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. How does that statement fit? Okay? That's a good question, John. Excellent question. It seems to me that the answer is found in verse 18 in the substance of the promise, where it says, Unto thy seed have I given this land. What is the identity of his seed to whom the land is given in verse 18? Who is it? Jacob, right? Jacob the nation. Agreed? Who was, who was in Egypt 400 years? Who was afflicted 400 years in, in Egypt? And who came out of Egypt with a mighty hand to inherit the land in the fourth generation? <clears throat> Jacob, right? Who was Jacob's father? Isaac, Abraham's heir who was promised in verse 4. So it's in fulfillment of his heir coming out of his own bowels that Jacob is born, and it's, that, it's through that means that the promise that his seed inherit, inheriting the land is fulfilled. So there is a connection. There would be no Jacob were there no Isaac. There would be no Isaac were there no fulfillment of the promise of 15.4. So it's intimately related with the promise of inheriting the land. As we shall later see when we consider the other passages in Genesis. Yes, Kevin. Um, as 
I read through, and if I were to read through this for the first time, I see the statement that God makes to Abraham, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. He makes it an unprovoked, almost a promise, if you will, to Abraham. And then Abraham asks him to give him something. What will you give me? And to me, as I read through that, I say, that looks like a promise, and and Abraham is asking for a token, or he's asking for something in response as proof. I think that's a very good observation. His observation has to do with verse 1, where God says, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And in response to that, Abraham asks a blessing. It's as though Abraham says, If this be so, then what blessing will you give me, seeing that I go childless? That's, I think that's right. That the very question that he asked was provoked by the assertion that God made concerning the fact that Abraham was the recipient of the favor and blessing of God. That God was Abraham's shield, that is, his protector, and that he was in the favor of God, that God himself was his exceeding great reward. And then he asked God for a blessing, for a gift. He poured out his heart to God, and the great concern of his heart was, I have no heir. My wife is barren. I'm childless. Would we say then that Isaac would be the, uh, the child of promise, would be the token? As long as Isaac was alive, Abraham knew that God's promise, uh, he knew it beforehand, because that was faith on his part, but it was a visible token of the absolute surety of God's promise. Well, no, I wouldn't say that Isaac was the token of the Abrahamic covenant, but I would say that the birth of Isaac was the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham and that Isaac was a child of promise, yes. Um, I think that you may have help with this matter of the token if we go to Genesis 17. But before we do, Cliff. Uh, you think that this uh, request for a uh, blessing by Abraham when, when God makes his promise is perhaps because uh, Abraham may have been uh, wavering in his faith back with the promise that God gave him when he said that he shall uh, go into Canaan. He said in uh, Genesis chapter 12, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be blessed and you shall be a blessing and he said, all families shall come out of the earth shall come out of you. And then here we have in Genesis 15, he still hasn't seen the fulfillment of the promise, yet God keeps on promising. Abraham's wondering, where is the promise? I think that's a very good point, Cliff, that there's an intimate connection between Abraham's struggle in Genesis 15 and God's favor already expressed to him in Genesis chapter 12. I think that's right. That's an excellent observation. Very good. Pastor Martin. Yeah. Couldn't we then call all of this data before it actually says the latter part of the chapter, it is a covenant. This is God's personal preparation. He didn't arbitrarily break in at a state in Abraham's life in which there'd be no connection between the condition of his soul mm. and his ability to receive that covenant and that God was spiritually, we would say existentially, preparing him for the making of the covenant, though these words were not the covenant itself. I thought that's excellent, yes, that, that, that the covenant... Uh, <laughs> amen. You know? The covenant did not exist in a vacuum, but it had a background, climate, and setting, and that, it, it, and that God prepared the very setting in which he would then make the promise. That's, that's it. Amen. I had to write that down. <laughs> Maybe I should have, I should probably I should have a fifth I should have had a fifth category up here I suppose to put in here the uh, the context because I wrestled with that or the setting how do you how do you set this in perspective and if you do that then you can get into Genesis 12 the general background or context or setting you can get into the first part of Genesis 15 you can get into Genesis 12 and that's very good thank you.
Now let's go on to Genesis 17, and we'll see if we can find some more with respect to the uh, Abrahamic covenant. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face. And God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Neither shall your name any more be called Abraham, I'm sorry, Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, that is, the father of a multitude, for... The father of a multitude of nations, I have made you, and I will make you exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come out of you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And I will give unto you and to your seed after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your seed after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of a covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every male throughout your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any foreigner that is not of your seed, he that is born in your house and he that is bought with your money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name, and I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son from her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings and peoples shall be from her. Then Abraham fell upon his face, and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to him that's a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, No, but Sarah your wife shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. 
but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear unto you at the set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were born or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin the selfsame day, as God had said to Abraham. And Abraham was ninety-nine years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised, and Ishmael his son, and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with his money, were circumcised with him. Right. Now, let us go and ask ourselves the same questions. With whom was the covenant made? With Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant. Who were the recipients? What is the substance? What is the token? Etc. Doug. It seems to be clear in this chapter that it's with the promises made to Abraham and his descendants. Verse 7. Okay. Read it, please. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. There you go. All right. Abraham and Abraham's seed. No question. Genesis 17:7. 7. Good. Henry. Circumcision. Genesis 17:11. Very good. Um Circumcision. That's circumcision in the flesh of the foreskin, circumcision of the males, right? Okay. I'm part of this. I'm sorry, I was just going to say physical circumcision of the body, right? Good. Yeah. Uh, part of the substance here is to be a God unto them, unto me. A part of the substance is to be a God unto him, and to who else? After. All right. Part of the substance, which is intimately associated, by the way, with inheriting the land of Canaan, is that they, the very seed that would inherit the land of Canaan, this seed would be the people of God. Agreed? Okay. Notice how the two are intimately connected. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, and I will be their God. See the connection? So verses 7 and 8 are a unit. I will establish my covenant. He emphasizes it again. It's established between Abraham and Abraham's seed after him throughout their generations. He will be his God and their God. They will be the people of God. And he will give to him and them the land of Canaan, and he will be their God. So there's the intimate connection. Here's the reaffirmation of the promise of Genesis 15, 18. And associated with it now is this connection, in this connection, he will be the God of Abraham's seed, that is, Abraham's posterity, who inherit the land of Canaan throughout their generations. He will be their God. See that? Intimate connection. Okay, anything else promised there in the substance? 
would it not be correct to uh, distinguish between the physical and the spiritual sea? Because the promises are an everlasting possession, and that only really to the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Well, I think in order to make a distinction here between physical and spiritual seed, you have to first read it into the passage. It seems to me that what's clearly promised here is the land of Canaan, and in that context he says he will be their God, and that's a very physical piece of real estate, and it's an underscoring of the same thing that was mentioned in Genesis 15. However, I am not denying the truth of which you speak that there is a distinction between the physical and spiritual seed of Abraham, more of which later. <laughs> yes, Doug? It should be added that the promise is made specifically to Isaac in verse 19 and 21. Oh. Isaac. But I will establish the covenant with Isaac. As opposed to whom? As opposed to Ishmael. Correct. Now somebody over here had his hand up first. All right. Who doesn't have it up now? Uh, George and then Peter. Uh, Ish Ishmael being circumcised, does he even uh, receive that covenant as well? Now, you, you're asking me. Well, I'll tell you what. Let me leave the question as to... The question really is, what, how come Ishmael was circumcised? We'll leave that question for a minute because let's go... We'll leave that question. That's a good question. I've wrestled with that question for years and years and years. I hope maybe I have an answer. But we'll wait first till we try to put out what the substance of it is. And, George, it may be that we have to leave that question till next week. But um, wait till we get the substance up here. What's the rest of the substance? There's more in the substance here, right? Peter? I have promised made to Abraham and Sarah, first for his son, right. and then for kings, and then for nations, plural. Uh, where do you find out about nations, plural, and kings? Where, uh, what are you talking about there? And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. What verse are you reading? Verse 6. Verse 6. All right. But let's go back to where he first mentions the establishment of the covenant with him. Now let's read the whole section under that. Because it's all a unit. And I will make my covenant with you and will multiply you exceedingly. And then he says this. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of a multitude of nations. And as the opening foundational statement under which it all hangs up until he emphasizes again this other dimension in verse 7. Right? You see that statement? You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Now that's what you're really talking about, isn't it? That whole section? Right? So how can you put this? Abraham is also promised, God swears to him, that Abraham will be the father of a multitude of nations, right? That his posterity will be composed of many distinct nations. <laughs> his posterity will be composed of many distinct nations. Nations. That's also promised to him in this context, is it not? Now, this is a very significant promise. So significant that it actually gives Abraham his distinguishing identity for the rest of his life. See the very next phrase. Neither shall your name be called any more Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham for... The father of a multitude of nations, I have made you. Why was his name called Abraham? It was in virtue of this promise. It was not in virtue of the promise of a land of Canaan given to his seed. 
But it was in virtue of this promise that he would be the father of many distinct nations, not just the nation of Israel, but many nations would come out of him, and kings would come out of him. And he will be exceeding fruitful, verse 6, and I will make nations, plural, come out of you, and kings shall come out of you, the father of a multitude of nations. His posterity will develop into many distinct whole nations of people. That's the promise sworn to Abraham. Right? And it's in virtue of that promise that his name is changed from Abram to Abraham. And that gives him his distinguishing identity. So this is another dimension of the Abrahamic covenant. This is something distinct, if I may put it this way. It's a second whole dimension of promise, distinct from the specific promise that a certain aspect of his posterity or his seed would inherit the land of Canaan. He would also be the father of a multitude of nations. <coughs> and in virtue of that, he is called Abraham. So you find a twofold focus in this passage. Again, his seed will inherit the land and they will be God's people. Genesis 17, 7 and 8. And he will be the father of a multitude of nations. That is, his seed will become many distinct nations. Genesis 17, verses 3 to 6. Now you can see that the focus of this covenant with Abraham is upon his posterity. They will become many nations. That's one great promise made to them. They will inherit the land of Canaan. That's another promise made to them. Okay? Now the, uh, the token of this, as we have seen, is circumcision. And this was to apply to anyone who came under the headship of his home, under the auspices of his domicile. Whether they were bought with money or whether they were born in his house, they were all to be circumcised, including Ishmael, all of them. They were all to be circumcised. But in a special sense, this covenant would be perpetuated and carried on not through Ishmael, but through Isaac. Agreed? Anything else in the passage that you want to say before we quit for today? Norman. It's interesting to note that the token of, is the, token of the covenant is identified with the covenant. Aha. Very good. The token of the covenant is identified with the covenant. Verse, please. That's in verse 10. Verse 10. This is my covenant which you shall keep. That's right. You, very, you find the very same thing with the, new, with the new covenant and the Lord's Supper. The token of the covenant is, is called the covenant where Jesus says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The token of the new covenant is identified and equated with the new covenant. So you find the same thing here with circumcision. He says, this is my covenant. The token of the covenant is said to be the covenant because it stands symbolically in intimate relationship to the sworn promises of God. It's very good, Norman. Good observation. Well, let me give you some passages to read and study for next time. Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Read the whole story. But in particular, study verses 17 and 18. Genesis 22, 17 and 18. Luke chapter 1, verses 73 and 74. And the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 8, verse 16, verse 19. And then turn back 
to Genesis chapter 12, particularly notice verse 3. Okay? Well, very good. Let's pray for the Lord's blessing upon what we've studied this morning. Father, we give you thanks for your holy word. And we pray for your blessing upon our study of it today, that you would write it upon our hearts, that you would glorify your name in us as we seek to take it to heart, that you will give us understanding minds and hearts, that we might see and appreciate the beauty and the glory of what you have done in making these promises.